privilege to be here. Uh, in, I had a brief gap in my dog career for five years. Was, uh, one, of the, one of the things I was doing was chairing the digital policy group here, involved in the energy policy group, and I always found this a really interesting, welcoming, warm, and uh, critical house, actually, in our city and our country to share ideas and thinking. I was last week on my campaign trail. I took time off and went in to visit Brendan Halligan in hospital and he was as wise and as committed and interested and engaged as ever and I'm uh, wishing him well in his full recovery uh, at this time. Um, one of the things recently in this house where I found it very useful, we were privileged to have, I have chaired the event actually, my colleague Philippe Lambert from the head of the European Greens in the European Parliament was here, gave a speech. And I thought it really set out a very interesting assessment of what's happening broadly in our European Union at this present time. He speaks, and I'm only summarizing it right down to a very short kind of a assessment. Our liberal demo democratic system is in a real uncertain period. There's real uh, doubts and division and a rise of populism, nationalism right across Europe and in states and elsewhere. Our assessment of that is it's an understandable reaction to the end of the old story. The story for 40 years, from I'm old enough to remember it, from the late 70s through to maybe 2008, that the market would deliver for you, was no longer credible in a whole range of different ways. Um, because of the crash and the effects of that. Because of the sense that there was a gap, a difference, and a leash, and people were being left behind. In that, and it was a me story. People need more than that. You know, these markets will rise, lifting all boats by looking after each other, or yourself, we'll, we'll all rise. Clearly wasn't working. And what Philippe put it in very simple terms is we needed we politics now to fill that gap. There are false we politics out there. I think Brexit is a false we politics. It's we against Europe, or Trump, we against the elite, we against... Oxford and Cambridge and Bruges. I won't name any Irish universities for fear there's anyone here from one of them. <laughs> but you know what I mean. And, and that explains a lot of what's happening in our union, in our country, and in the wider world. We think that green politics is the we politics, the next story, the future story of our time. Because it exact, to make the scale of change we need to make to address the real fundamental crisis we're in, the advance of climate change, the huge extinctions that are taking place on the biodiversity loss. It will only work if we actually pull together and of people of all different political strands work in cooperation to make the scale and the speed of the change we need to make. And that drives our politics at this time. It drives our politics in the European Parliament, um, where we have a key interesting position. It's still, the old way is still there with the Christian Democrats, Liberals and Social Democrats kind of just about having the majority, but it needs that new green element, I think, to hold it together and to set a course for Europe that really works in a new way. It works, I hope, here at home. We're, we, we've said in this election that we will work with all parties because it won't work if we go down the divisive of American or Australian route in tackling climate change, if it's a left-right divide, or an urban-rural divide, or a young versus old divide, we won't make the scale of change we need to make. I remember Brendan talking to him once in the Dáil, in the Dáil Café a few years ago. He just said something in passing. He, I think he said Jacques Delors had come once here to do an assessment of how Ireland had integrated into the European Union. And I think he said that Delors' assessment was, he was doing it for the Commission, was that the reason Ireland had been successful compared to other countries is that there was actually a unified position for a significant period of time in what we were doing. In that period from the late 50s, early 60s, when Richard Gordon Lamas set us into this course then of changing from a closed economy to an open economy, um, we had a stable political commitment to that goal. And in that stable political environment for 20, 30 years, we were able to do the key policy changes we needed to do to make the, the leap then. Investing in education, creating foreign direct investment environment, joining the European Union, and by 
making those sort of policy changes and have a consistent environment political agreement around the broad approach, we've seen the incredible transformation of this country to one of the most successful, if we're honest, countries in the wider world. We need a similar, in my mind, commitment now for the next 5, 10, 20 years that going green is going to be the strategic direction for our country. It's a difficult story we're asking, talking downstairs about how come this hasn't been quite centre stage in the election? Well, it's difficult because it's so big. It changes everything. It's changing the entire energy system, transport system, waste system, industrial system, farming system, economic system, for the better. And I think whoever is elected on Saturday, one of the first tasks, that whoever a putative possible coalition arrangement may be, is to sit down with the, with the public service, with agencies like the IAEA and others, to actually plot out a new program for government which sets us on that path, the critical path for this next decade. I'm proud to be a member of the European Greens because we're a very strong uh, United European Party. Uh, Ska Keller, our other co-leader in the European Parliament with Philippe, was in Dublin at the weekend helping us with our campaign. She made the point, we have four governments now where we have got presence on the European Council, and the European Council of Ministers particularly, where in my experience you can have real effect. You can actually do things. That's where we need to be. That's where we can really work effectively to get the fundamental underlying change which will help us rise. I want to give a couple of examples about that. What, you know, what, could we, what should we be saying on the European Council? as well as in the Parliament, as well as working with the Commission. I might start honouring Brendan, because I remember I was here about 10 years ago, the one project I want to mention, close to his heart. And I gave a speech here 10 years ago as Energy Minister at the time and said, we have a huge potential in this country to develop offshore wind in a way that powers our country for the future. And 10 years on, as well as working in the IEA when I was away from the Dáil, I worked with E3G in London for five years, worked in climate diplomacy with the German government, French government, Dutch, British governments at a very high level. And actually, it's taken us 10 years, but I think we're at a moment now in Europe when we realise, yes, offshore wind particularly is going to be one of the real driving opportunities to power the European Union into the future. And this country is a huge chance in that. We could and should and will put five gigawatts of offshore wind in the Irish Sea as a first step. We do it using the auction system that they've devised in other European countries to make sure we get best value. And we have to maximize and make sure it's environmentally sensitive. Protect, we protect our environment at the same time. And we maximize the economic development potential in our ports, particularly where we will build, assemble, ma and maintain all these turbines. But that's only the start. We need to go offshore in the west, southwest, and northwest at scale. We should be setting the target of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind within the next 20 years. It's a huge project. They're huge machines, 12 megawatt machines, floating turbines held to the ground with, with, with a very sophisticated tech, tech, technology. But this is the cheapest form of new power. And this gives us the opportunity, not just to use that power in our own country to run our transport system, to heat our homes, to manage this digital and help support this digital revolution that's taking place in which we're particularly strong in, but also it allows us to export and share that power with the rest of Northwest Europe and beyond. That is the big technological energy revolution that is taking place. All the financing will go towards that. European policy is framed towards that. And we have real potential because we're good at it. The likes of Airgrid are best in the world. We project companies, we people in this country with real skills, and we turn to them. It's a European Union project, but I cite it, I bring it up, because actually it's a critical project for cooperation with the UK. Whatever happens with Brexit, we cannot allow us to become isolated islands because in this transformation to tackle climate change, we cannot do it alone. This industrial revolution is all about the balancing of variable demand and variable supply. That's really difficult and complex and important at the distribution level, but it also needs to be done at that regional level, where new HVDC cables share powers over long distances with low losses, and each country supports each other to actually have a secure, competitive, and low carbon energy system. In the negotiations, we've been close touch, thanks to Simon Coveney and others, 
with what's going on. I've never heard a single mention that the UK negotiators don't agree with that assessment because the truth is there isn't a better way. I think it's vital for us in the negotiations we have ahead of us. We have such a huge challenge. We have to organise how the North of Ireland stays within the customs union, a political project. We have 10 different other projects we have to deliver, not just a bare bones free, free trade agreement in the next six months, but also all those complex issues around how we manage fisheries, how we manage data, how we manage energy, how we manage security, how we manage people movement. I think we have a particular role, hopefully we could bring it into the European Council, to make sure in areas like that, of very central to the transition in energy and in data management, which is, it's all connected. Those grids, this network system, this balancing will only really work when we have common rules around how we share data and how we manage the digital side of the transformation. Um, I hope as well that we can take from the European Council some of the lessons or some of the ideas that are coming in terms of what the future transport is. There are three revolutions occurring at our time. One is the clean energy revolution, the other is the digital revolution. They're connected together. The third is a transport revolution. Rory, you know this in terms of how we've got planning wrong in this country how we're doing a disservice to our people by this ever outward sprawl, this disconnect between housing and transport. And everyone's promising we'll build 20,000 houses, we'll build 50, we'll build 100,000. But no one's talking about how do you build communities as you do that. It's through transport-led development, putting in the public transport, cycling and walking infrastructure first and then bringing the housing in around it. The European Union's important in that, not just because they have expertise or good examples, but they've clearly set their course on the European Green Deal as the centre of European strategy now. I met, it was a pleasure, pleasure meeting the, commission, the, pres the President of the European Commission, Ms. van der Leyen, uh, uh, in Dublin Castle two weeks ago. And I have to say my assessment, a good chance to talk to her, is that she's clearly committed to this as our central strategy. I've met Andrew McDowell on the same occasion, head of lending in EIB in the energy space, and he again made the point that we need, that they're lending, they're looking for lending opportunities, but only if it's going in this Green New Deal direction. I also watched, pleasure, Brendan suggested I do it, uh, Danny McCoy speaking from this very podium four weeks ago, three weeks ago, where he recognised that actually our business community has been really successful in recent years, but our state is not, hasn't grown in commensurate terms. It was fascinating to hear that actually the head of the IBEC, the business community, is saying we need a bigger state. I think he's right. We need investment in infrastructure, particularly in housing, in transport, in energy, in all these areas that I'm talking about. We can't do that if we're cutting taxes at the same time. It's a hard message to get out during an election, but I think it's an honest assessment of where we are. We have to invest in our capital infrastructure, both the public 8 billion euro budget growing, but also, as Danny says, there's that 120 billion private capital budget that's been spent in this country every year. One of the jobs we would have, if we were fortunate to be part of a coalition arrangement in the future government, would be to actually steer that 120 billion in this green direction. And that's where Europe's going. When I meet people in the business community, they realise that that actually is what they need to do because their shareholders, the pension funds and others who invest in them, will not work, will not fund, will not stick with companies that are ignoring the, the big issue crisis of our time, which is climate change and biodiversity loss. One other area where Europe is going to be critical, where we have to manage it on a north-south basis as well as east-west, is in the whole future of Irish agriculture. We think it has to be framed within a land use plan which is looking really ambitiously about how we develop a new form of forestry that restores biodiversity as well as storing carbon. Critically, we manage our peatlands. This is an integrated European project because we'll have to stop the horticultural, the extraction of peat for horticultural exports, mainly to the Dutch growers, to store that carbon in the ground. And we will have to employ tens of thousands of people here to manage it and do it in a skilled way. And in farming, whoever's in government, in the next year, two years, has a critical task of negotiating the reform of the common agricultural policy. I, sometimes you can be critical of the Commission, friends of mine in the Commission themselves, and say they're a bit, they are a bit 
elite like. I remember once I had an event, climate change event in a, the mansion house, and I was in the front door because I was a bit nervous would anyone tow up, turn up, and the usual collection of Greens were arriving in their duffel coats and whatnot. <laughs> And suddenly, it was, it was time when the presidency was on, Ireland had it. Suddenly, these people arrived that looked like elves arriving at Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings. They were cut from a cleaner cloth. They were fine hair, scarves perfectly placed over. And I was looking at myself on the door, who are these? It's the European Commission, <laughs> I realized. But I think the Commission itself, and from working closely with it, has recognized that this kind of breakdown of them and us this sense of top-down elite actually isn't going to serve our union. The union will work best now in a new way when actually it does give nations and local communities greater flexibility and authority to make our way in a way that works. And I've seen that in the way that climate change European policy has been done. I think it's correct. The overall goal is set. And then they're leaving it to national governments to decide what's best for your country to progress. Same in the common agricultural policy. There's a recognition of the nine objectives the union wants to achieve, which I think we all agree on, in terms of getting better price for farmers, restoring biodiversity, improving water quality, as well as have, have, having high quality food. But they're leaving it up to governments, national governments, to come back with what their best way is. Ska was telling me at the weekend, I think it's correct, that actually the current plans for cap reform are not ambitious enough. But that does not hold us back from setting our course in a greener direction for our farmers and other land users as we go. I'm only skimming over the whole variety of different issues, but there's one other, and I look forward to the questions uh, that you may have and to answer them as, to the best of my ability. But there's a couple of other points I want to make. Um, our vision of the European Union, we've often, I suppose in the past, we've been very critical. We voted against a lot of the treaties Nice and Maastricht and going back in ages. Our party comes with four core principles. One is that we have to take an ecological, and this comes from the start, this comes from our first Green Party in Tasmania and still here today as our core principles. The first is you have to take an ecological approach, understanding how living systems are working and manage our policy to protect and restore those systems. Second principle is that social justice has to come in that transformation. The two go together. The third is that we are pacifists. We believe that the way forward isn't through military might or endeavor. And actually, even when you come down to the local level, the form of politics is important in terms. Not that you don't stick to your values and your ideas, but that you treat others with respect. The fourth is that we we trust people, we trust democratic <coughs> systems, and we trust decision-making at the lowest effective level. I heard Catherine Day in an interview she did to this house a few weeks ago saying something very similar. The European Union has to learn how does it, you know, where does it make decisions that work, and where is it best at national or indeed at local government level. But I want to go back to that third one, the pacifist element, because there is a real debate now in the future of Europe and where we're going. And there is voices for increasing expenditure in defense and kind of a fortress Europe, you might call it, type approach. I don't believe that will work. I don't believe it actually suits our country to hitch our wagon to that sort of vision of the future. I don't believe we can expand, which we do need to do, our funding of the common agricultural policy and expand as we need to do our investment in these new energy grid systems which really power Europe and at the same time have a massive increase in defense expenditure. I don't believe it would actually work in any case. The only way, the best way to secure our future is to work with our neighbours and indeed all countries in our union to actually stabilise the climate so that that ultimate big security risk does not come to, place, come, come to pass. Because if it does, I don't see how we manage it. How do we manage if what the... I went to the Potsdam Institute with Brendan five years ago from this house in Berlin, the best climate scientists of all, Stefan Remsdorf and others, showing us the work they were doing for the World Bank. What would a world look like in, in a four degree temperature rise? And I'll never forget as they turned over the work they were doing for the World Bank and there was a map of India in front of us and the massive center of it was red, red hot heat, which means it would not be a habitable place, the very center of India. And the truth is, what we're seeing happening in the world today is those sort of centers where people would not be able to stay, mass migration would come, 
is not just in India, it probably is on our southern borders and including some of our own southern countries, that will come to pass. We have to make this work by following that same idea I have about sharing power across Northwest Europe to actually using this new renewables and new economic system as an opportunity for every area to rise. I am sorry if that sounds a bit hippie or a bit idealistic or a bit, but I don't see a better security approach. And for this country, I think it fits our purpose. It suits, well, it suits well with us in having that cooperative arrangement, particularly with the range of countries to the south of us, where we're asking each other for help rather than telling each other what to do. That's one of the reasons I think maybe we've missed this opportunity in Europe in the last 20 years, last 10 years even, that loss of faith in our liberal democratic systems. I think the approach we did to reunification was great. It was so good that we brought 10 countries in but did we do it in a way where we were slightly thinking, we know best, and you copy us, and we tell you what to do? And not surprisingly, people in those countries said, actually, we don't want to be told what to do. We want to have, you know, we have a certain pride in our own identity, and that's behind some of the populist risings that we're seeing. So that frames what I think we should be doing in the European Council, or the voice we should have, and I know it's shared by my German Green colleagues and others, we have a very good chance, I hope, of being in power in the next year and steering Europe in that way. We should have an honest and open debate about it, but that's where we come from. Um, I'm very conscious of time. And I leave it at that and look forward to your questions. Um, I'm last, one thing I'd last, last thing I'd say. In a time of uncertainty, in a time of great confusion maybe in politics, I come out of this election with a sense of pride in our country and our people and our democratic system. We have a good parliamentary democracy. It gets a lot of abuse and a lot of right to listen, we're, we can't press buttons and we're fobbing for all sorts of things. But our political system and our constitutional system is strong. It will manage, we will manage, we will have to follow the constitution, whoever's elected to go into that new chamber and we'll sit down and work together. It may take some weeks or months now, particularly with Tipperary being uncertain. But I'm confident that actually we can make the next step up. I'm confident that going with this we politics, and we've seen some of it in the outgoing Dáil, agreement on our Brexit approach, agreement on Solange Claire, agreement on the whole, agreement on the climate. We have made the first step by actually collectively saying, yes, there's an emergency and we will work together to solve it. Now is the time to take up that challenge, help lead our people. And that's what we seek to do. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you first and foremost, Eamon, for that uh, very widespread and, and thoughtful uh, expose of, of where we are at the moment and where we hope to get to together. Uh, we're now moving into questions and answers. Uh, Eamon has agreed to take all questions. Uh, everything is going to be on the record uh, and if you are part, uh, first of all I'd like you, those of you who want to speak to indicate your name and if you're affiliated to a particular organisation that you feel important to notify to us to say that as well. So I'm open for anybody who wants to speak. You've stunned them into silence. <laughs> we do many silence. I see, yes, there, yourself. Thanks, Mark Bennett, um, speaking for myself in this context. Um, when I studied environmental science, my mum used to say to people I was an environmentalist. Back then I would say, no, no, environmental scientist, somehow to apologise for being a little bit of a hippie, let's say. And I think what's wonderful, I work with many young people now, you know, early stage professionals, and they're no longer apologetic, they're indignant. And I think that's wonderful. And much of what I've heard Eamon talk about is... Um, very competent, very progressive, very ambitious. But I wonder sometimes do we still apologize for our envi environmentalism? And I wonder, hopefully, are the grounds shifting now? I, I was, um, just in response to what you said, there are young people particularly very concerned. And one of the, sometimes the concern I have is terrified would be the description underlying, you know, deep down an, a, a certain terror about when they hear and read the science of what's coming. And I think the answer to that is important because if we're just frozen with fear, we won't easily make the leap. And we need to give our people a certain sense of confidence that we can do this. 
And it leads you into very kind of um, interesting waters in my mind, because if we just talk about the technocratic aspect of it, the sense of kind of gigawatts here, or even I'm, I'm the worst culprit, HVDC, as soon as I've said those terms, you've lost half the audience. Actually, what it is, the scale of change you need to make in my mind, is almost a leap in consciousness. There's a leap in sense of our connection to nature and our connection to each other. And I'm sorry if that sounds very hippie, but actually I think it's the, fun, it's the key issue. We did a lot of work, particularly in the five years when I wasn't in the Dáil, on a series of climate conversations when we were asking, how do we tell this story? And we came to the view that actually you have to win the hearts, not just the heads that you have to listen to people and ask for the help rather than telling them what to do, to admit uncertainty. We don't know all how this is going to keep, technology keeps changing and the economics keeps changing. Um, sometimes we have to hasten slowly, which is the most difficult because there's such a sense of urgency, but sometimes if you go with that, with the, you, you frighten people and also you may make mistakes. And ultimately, the key narrative we were talking about is bringing this back home. Like there's so much a sense of these, these huge big challenges and then, but how does that, and that's why I think people are switched off, like have you changed your light bulbs and the world is burning? It doesn't connect. The way we connect it is by talking about our own homes, our own place, our own communities, and actually doing this bottom up as well as top down. And engaging people in that process, in, I mean, Come back to what I said, the European Commission has realised that a wee politics is going to require a slightly different approach where they give governments and local government flexibility. But similarly, I think in the outgoing programme for government, outgoing government, the programme for government, I think it was page 13 of it, they said, our form of public consultation is not working with the public sector to the communities. It's slightly tick box and people don't feel that they're really being listened to or engaged. And actually, one of the things the next government has to do, and it's not, this doesn't belong to any party, Fine Gael and the independents recognised it in their last manifesto, in the last programme for government, is actually to do this bottom up and, and really thinking global but acting local. The advantage of this is, in my mind, no matter what is happening in the wide, wider world, if we're restoring nature and building community in our own areas, it gives a certain sense of resilience. It gives a sense of purpose. It gives a sense that we can actually meet this challenge. You're breaking it down in, into bite-sized chunks and actually bring it at home. How we improve people's homes, how we move around, how we get food, how even the business community is not now the master of all. It's serving the people. Business, the role of business. I come from a business background. I see business as a creative act which is connecting to supporting society, not that society serves business. And it's that change almost in philosophy or in psychology or in sense of connection, and it's coming from right down close to the heart yourself. That's, what we, it, it, that's the story we have to tell that makes people feel, yeah, I'm part of this, we're going to do our best, this is going to be good for us. And, and I don't think there's any apologies for that. I think that's part of the politics we need now, is a slightly different language around environmentalism, and certainly away from the idea that this is something subset elsewhere. The best person of all in those climate conversations we had was Tommy Tiernan in the Abbey, and Tommy in his own, don't talk to me about the environment, if at the very centre isn't the human being. And he put, the comedian had the best lines, the best summary of what we need to be doing. And that's what I've been trying to do. Thank you. Question there, that young lady there, yep. Um, hi, it's Claire from the Australian Embassy. Um, just a question on global trade and trade in general. I was just wondering if you are in support of the sort of ongoing negotiations between the EU at the minute with Australia and New Zealand, amongst others. And if you are, you know, from an Australian point of view, these are really negotiations and trade, or, or trade that would support services. But there's obviously a lot of concerns within the agricultural community in Ireland. So how you would navigate that if you were in support of the negotiations and if you aren't in support of the negotiations, could you elaborate on why not? We think the <coughs> future economy, it isn't just going to be all local. This won't work if it's not under the UNFCCC Paris Climate Agreement and, and the rules and the implementation of that is critical. And not just 
the rules in the Paris Agreement, but back up agreements like the Task Force on Climate Change Financial Disclosure. Dan, you had your colleague over in, in Deloitte's recently speaking about that. Those sort of basic rules of accounting have to change so that the full cost of environment, the full externalities of any business activity is taken into account. That's coming. That's inevitable because, as I say, this is such a huge challenge that threatens everyone. Business cannot keep going the same old way. And, and for us, there is real advantages about taking technology from different parts of the world and the benefits of, of trade. Um, I, I, I watched, in preparing for this, I went back to look at the questioning of Commissioner van der Leyden in the European Parliament by her own group. And I, be, I remember her speaking on that about looking at some sort of carbon, uh, carbon coming into the trading arrangements. Uh, not, not just in aviation and shipping, but, but in other areas. And I, I, if I'm reading her correctly in terms of where they want to go, and I think that's correct. Europe, one of the reasons why you would want to get into the European Council and European Parliament is Europe has the scale and the ability to set new standards, to set the rules. And I don't think we should be any way ashamed or embarrassed in Europe of setting high standards on environmental standards to try and change the entirety of global trade. Um, and you do that with all governments. I'd have to say in Australia, you know, the few agricultural trading with Europe, but one, in the same event I was talking about Dan, someone was making the point Australia now is in real difficulty because increasingly in Australia they can't get insurance to cover crop failure because climate change is so real and so devastating in its effect. And actually in our discussions about that, thinking it's all just going to be the same and it's all going, you know, Australia or Brazil or other locations are not going to have difficulties because of climate change is missing the real big picture of what's happening. And I don't, and I think there is also, I mean, I was at the climate summit, sorry to say this, but Australia was dinosaur, fossil fuel dinosaur of the day pretty much every day because its own government is not stepping up to the plate. It's not alone. <coughs> Japanese government are reading the papers today saying they want to build, is it 20 new coal-fired power stations? That's coal-fired power stations that will pollute the environment for us all. And, and we do have to start stepping up and calling out um, governments that are not willing to really abide by the Paris Climate Agreement. I think one of the roles this government or this country could do Again, supporting the European Union in the next, sorry, supporting the UK government in the next year, working with their head of COP26, I think, isn't it, in Glasgow, and actually putting our div di diplomatic shoulder to the wheel in getting every country to start backing up the Paris Climate Agreement. And for those who are not, that they have to be called out, because if we do not heed and, and implement the Paris Agreement, in my mind, we will not be able to manage this change. We will be putting all our peoples at incredible security risk. And I think um, the detail is in the agreement. I remember when it was being signed, one of the Irish civil servants saying to me, hope it isn't shortened. It wasn't. It is there as a legal document which show, shows out how each government should trade and work in this way. But we cannot abandon it. If it's not adhered to by next November, we're in deep trouble. I hope Australia will step up to the plate. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, man there, please. Johnny Shine, uh, UCD Energy Institute and Greenlink Interconnector. Uh, Eamon, thank you very much for some very interesting thoughts. Um, the, the scenario you set out for uh, offshore wind is truly staggering. So uh, in the context, if you think of Money Point, our biggest station is less than one gigawatt. So. I'm just wondering what you think are they, the most important things we need to do over the next two, three years to actually make it happen? I mean, you're talking about a European level resource, not just an Irish resource. You've asked my chosen subject, Johnny, and, and I think the, you and the work that others have done gives me confidence because we have engineers of real capability. We need good engineering at the centre of this and we need political support for good engineering. Um, and the engineering is, I, I, Mark Ferguson, the head of Science Foundation Ireland, came into recently looking for advice and what, what should they be investing in, answer the really big questions that face our country. And the first one is, how do we transfer 30 gigawatts of power into the Northwest European electricity market? How do we best manage that? And we've done a lot of work on this. That IELTS project we did 10 years ago, uh, the work that Airgrid have done. Um, the European Commission is, is absolutely committed to it. I know from personal experience, the German government and French and Dutch 
and even and not even and the British governments are committed to this. Thirty gigawatts sounds a lot, five six times our current power use as we speak probably, but actually in the scheme of things, that's that's what we need to do. There will be two or three hundred gigawatts going into the North Sea. One of the ch things I was proud to have done in the European Council when I was on it, just a critical small change instead of the North Sea Offshore Grid Initiative, which was meant to be, I changed it to the North Seas Offshore Grid Initiative, recognising that the wind resource we have, particularly in the Northwest and West, is actually a huge resource for, for Europe, because when you have these, like we have today, high pressure probably over the centre of Europe, there's still wind in the Northwest, and we have a comparative competitive <coughs> advantage in that. Brendan Halligan used to put it, the way he used to put it, he was interested in this idea, that it's similar to that opportunity we recognised back in the 60s, that the comparative advantage we had in grass growth led to Kerry Gold and the Irish agricultural ex industries. Well, we similarly have a comparative competitive advantage in wind, offshore wind particularly. And it, it's just an engineering question now as to how we trap it, and critically, the grid being central, how we move it around. Um, that's difficult engineering, but my experience, I don't want to be naming names or criticising anyone, but I remember when we first set the higher renewable target of 40%, one of the top best engineers, grid engineers in the country, has told me, you're mad, you'll never get more than 800 megawatts on an Irish system, it's not physically possible. We went ahead anyway, and lo and behold, what do we have today, about 4 gigawatts, 3 or 4 gigawatts on our system? I think we'll learn by doing. I think we should first and foremost go to the European Commission, the next government, and the European Council and say, as part of our role in addressing Europe's climate, we will do this as a European project and bring in all the expertise. And the same time we do it, we do marine protected areas. I would go 50%, the Commission is saying 30%, but we actually um, take huge chunks of the Northwest Atlantic and actually start restoring biodiversity there while having floating turbines on top. And we get our best scientists as our contribution, the second thing I said to Mark Ferguson, we don't know exactly what's going on in the North Atlantic. It's a critical question for the world as to what's happening with the circulation system and the, bio and the ecosystem there. <coughs> I know Mark Mellish, the head of our armed services, is actually very interested in this. And I think the Navy and our marine research agencies have a real role at the same time as we put the engineering technology in we put all our research science in as a global project to see what's happening in the Northwest Atlantic, what's happening with the ecosystems, what's happening with the, on, as the ice melt comes down from the, Ar from the Arctic and as the Fair circulation enough. system weakens. It's that scale of ambition we should have. Thank you very much. There's a question here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Uno Dwyer, member of the Institute. Uh, you've spoken uh, about the need for connecting with the people in order to convince them to follow the green ambition for a proper challenge to or a proper approach to climate change, as you've uh, set it out. Uh, a few days ago here, Michal Martin spoke in general with regard to the future convention on the future of Europe, uh, about the need for connecting with the people also in a more general way in, in order to meet the challenges of populism about which you also spoke and other challenges to our democratic system. Do you think that the green way of bottom-up connectedness approach can be used also in this more general context of the future of Europe, of assuring the future of Europe? And by the way, how, about, how are you going to persuade the East Europeans to follow the green way of thinking. Thank I was you. talking to my colleague Kieran Coff earlier, asking me for advice before coming here, new MEP. Um, want to answer that last question first. Want the, you know, how do we the how do avoid Eastern the mistakes in terms of Eastern European? One of the things I believe in, we should be advancing with real honesty and speed the expansion of the Union further east and southeast, Serbia, Albania, Macedonia, various countries. I think if we play this as a defense of locking everyone out, we, we go no further, that'll send out a terrible message. And I think we should learn maybe some of the mistakes from the past in terms of not allowing local flexibility in new countries coming in so that those new countries don't see it as a punitive, we know best, top-down sort of way. 
Um, so I think it does have to be, those sort of big strategic decisions have to be taken. At, now that's the European Council, not the Council of Minutes, well it's the kind of General Affairs Council I guess, but th that's at the highest level. I think, particularly for our country, we're, my experience on the European Council was we're in a unique position. We're not know-it-all fancy dans like the Scandinavians. We're not the old imperial powers of the big central countries. We, now we play it every which way, but, but, but we do have a good role. We ha I found I could get on well with the Baltic states and friends from Bulgaria or others. It was just there's something in our culture that actually we could have a unique role. We don't have some of the historic baggage that maybe make, make other countries fearful of that expansion. And I think we should start maybe with that big high level ambition. We keep our union expanding and in diversity there will be strength. Thank you. Question here. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Moore. I'm speaking in a personal capacity, but I work for the National Treasury Management Agency. Um, maybe a couple of comments and one question. Um, I'll be voting green number one, and this is the first time I'll have ever done that. However, everything you spoke about, I firmly believe in entirely. And I guess the reason why I vote number one today is it's the first time I feel politics really is at the point of becoming mainstream for green and have a real impact. So while all the political parties would echo the kind of comments you're saying, Eamon, I don't believe there's any part that will hold them to account to switch from rhetoric to action uh, other than the Greens, and for that reason I think this is different. Um, my question relates more bringing you back grounded to where you might sit in a few weeks' time and actions on a very local level. Um, you know, we might raise more taxes to do bigger things and all the big stuff, but resources in government to actually um, bring about the change. So for instance, the offshore wind point and any other sector, it needs resources in different government departments capable of bringing through the measures that are imagined under the Climate Action Plan. So in my role, for example, uh, we're approved to invest, not spend, invest 500 million to a billion of taxpayers' money in the transition to net zero. And so that brings me to interact with many different government departments and what I find is that while I find many capable individuals, there aren't enough of them to actually execute upon that change. So one of the cheapest things <laughs> I think we can do, which isn't requiring a lot of taxpayers' money, is simply put the right resources in the right places to make a difference. And while I don't uh, uh, offer up any kind of support for the, the politics of Dominic Cummins, as an individual to affect change in the civil service, he seems to be very good at that. And I wonder if you would see any parallels for an Irish version of that to emerge. Okay, can I just very quickly, if I can just go through the funding side of that, because it's, it's, it's rightly asked all the time. And what we're saying in terms of funding this transition, it's about switching funding within our own capital budget in transport, away from roads towards public transport, in cap, away from industrial farming to less ex extensive. It is about issuing green bonds. We've done that twice now, and very successful, very low rates. That's where the international finance money is going to. It's not doing tax cuts, you know, promising to cut every tax and then p p potentially raise some very uncertain taxes on in, in, in tangible assets is not, in my mind, going to work. It is also um, about using that private capital budget. Going back to Danny McCoy's speech here, that you know that is a budget that we can. It's, the public budget is nine eight billion. That's 120 billion, according to him. Well, let's get that working in, on our side. But also to go back to his point, and I said this, I was interviewed by Pat Kenny on News Talk this morning, and I was again following up his call for a bigger state, and, and, and Pat coughed and kind of, and then, but, but you don't mean civil servants, he said. And I said, I do. We do need actually civil servants capability to do the sort of scale of thing we need to do to plan that grid, to plan the tra public transport infrastructure, to plan mm -hmm. the cap reform. It has to be done by civil servants. And I'll take an example of the department I knew best, Department of Climate Change, Communications, Climate Action, Environment is called now. I think it only has about 250 civil servants dealing with the entirety of our, ca our climate change transition, the entirety of European energy policy, the entirety of digital policy, which on its own, you could do with 250 civil servants working. So you, now part of that will be transforming people from other government departments to war. It can't be just heap on everywhere. But it does need more civil servants and stop, if we believe in public service, particularly from the left as I come from, we stop denigrating public yeah. servants. 
because how can you have faith, the public faith behind this message if you're on the one hand saying we need more state and then the other time you say the state isn't up to it. We also need though within the public service to introduce a willingness to fail and a, not a scared conservative tick box covering your ass um, kind of approach. It has to be willing to take risks and fear that you're not going to end up excoriated in prime time two months later for having made a mistake. We have to be willing to innovate and to be flexible and tolerate people taking certain risks. And it's that culture from the start. It, it needs to go back to as well what, what Whitaker did from the centre. It has to, to start in public expenditure reform and finance. They have to be willing to start taking some risks and start setting that attitude of innovation in the public service. But it also needs more public civil servants because we can't cope, as Danny McCoy said, we need the state to be slightly bigger to make it work, make it happen. Thank you. There's a question there to yourself. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> John Cross, a personal question. Um, that I was formerly in the National Parks and Wildlife Service where I had particular interest and responsibility for native woodlands <coughs> and forestry. Um, like all the other parties, Eamon, you have said that we must increase our area of forestry. But the, every government has set targets in the past and they have never yet been met. And at the moment, planting levels are at the lowest ever. And one of the reasons for that is that farmers are very resistant to change despite the very generous grants they get. Um, just in relation to that, I read recently that scientist, a scientist was quoted as saying that uh, scientists are very good at facts and figures, but they're not very good with persuading people. And they're not trained to do that. And I just wonder what your response to that is, would be and how would you manage to persuade people to change their attitudes to confront the problems of climate change? Thank You're right you. what you say about farmers. I Thank spent you. a lot of time talking to farmers. And once, well, you mentioned the word forestry, they grow. Um, one of the ways I think we could change, the government in the last budget set aside a significant amount of capital for Brexit preparations. And a lot of that, in my mind, is probably going towards the food industry, probably targeted to a lot of companies who are going to be in difficulty if, they're, if we don't get a, a functioning trade deal. I would prefer to take something like 500 million euro of that estimate, rough estimate of what it would cost, and go to every single farmer and say, we want you to plant a hectare of native woodland as a way of providing us corridors of native um, species, and also as a way of storing carbon, fuel for the farm into the future, but also critically to win over and to bring into the fold that farming community. Um, and I think there's broad agreement around that now. It's true what you say, this goes back to from the ideas into the doing. The truth is our forestry sector is on its knees at the moment. You can't get a planning permission to open up a road. You can't get a planning permission to get a clear felling license or, or even a, a forestation license. So it needs to scale up. And, and I think to scale up from roughly 4,000 hectares to about 20,000 hectares is, is the scale of forestation I think we should be going for. Within a land use plan where maps out which wetlands will be rewetted, which areas for forestry, what type of forestry. And from my mind, it is a radical shift away from clear felling monoculture towards continuous cover, close to nature forestry. It's a long-term project, take time to set it up, take time to get the real value from that, but I believe that's where we need to go because that helps address the biodiversity crisis, which is just as significant as the climate crisis. I got into a lot of trouble when I mentioned the word wolves once on a radio program a while ago <laughs> because I was trying to explain that concept, the poric phobus you speak so well about from uh, the National Wildlife, the, the Wildlife Trust, to say actually a lot of it will be letting forests come up themselves and managing. How do you manage invasive species? How do we manage that kind of overgrazing of those native forests coming back? And, and it was just that, that was the reason I, I kind of got into lots of trouble in it, but it was trying to make the point that really the scale of our ambition in restoring biodiversity should be just as great as it is in climate change. And the two go together, because rewetting our bogs will store carbon and bring back nature. Nature going to continuous cover forestry will restore nature and store carbon. Um, the, this is, the two go together. And, and you're right, our forestry sector is in chaos at the moment. But Quilch have started, they've started a new section within it. It's only five million euro section. I would turn the entire business in that way. Thank you. There's a lady over there at the corner, please. 
Thank you, Sposiswe is my name. I am the member of the institute. Could, could I ask you to stand up so we can hear you better, please? Thank you. Sposiswe is my name, and I am the member of the institute. I just want to ask about uh, the affordability of energy in terms of uh, people. What is, what is your plan in making energy available, affordable for poor people, people who live below poverty line? Uh, you equated um, housing with transport. We hear all the time that uh, people should uh, stop uh, driving, use public transport. Public transport, which is not there, by the way, especially in rural areas. And I haven't heard you talking about how you plan to address that. I come from a transport campaigning background before I went into politics, and I always had this sense that moving away from a car-dominated system to one which is really promotes walking, cycling, and public transport is because that actually is a social project. It, it, the people with the least income often cannot afford either the car or the lot of the public transport services. So it, is, and it has to be, this as Gmetra was saying, every place matters, uh, every community matters. It has to be solutions for rural communities as well as urban. And that requires a massive shift. That's why we say we're shifting away from the roads budget to the public transport, because currently we have 51 major national motorways and roads projects in construction or in planning. We do not have a single major public transport project in planning. And I've been 13 years waiting for us to start addressing cycling and making it safe, and I see nothing happen yet. Can I just go back to the wider issue though about energy poverty and, 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 the, and in the looking after our homes, go back to speaking earlier on, and retrofitting. And, and one of the advantages, and what give people a sense of hope in our political system, why I stand up for it, is we now have agreement in the political system. The All Party Oireachtas Committee on Climate Action really looked at this in detail and said, yes, one of the key projects we all agree on is retrofitting the about 1.5 million homes that are very energy inefficient um, and actually putting on insulation, putting on solar panels, putting in a heat pump. It's expensive. It's a 50 billion euro project. We also need to address our social housing at the same time, indeed start there and learn from that to how we apply it to the other houses. The great prize in this um, is firstly it's making healthier homes for people. And when you come down in the morning in a cold morning like this and the kitchen is warm, it's an incredible difference. It's a subtle thing, but it's hugely beneficial to people's health and well-being and sense of comfort and security. Also, it avoids and gets rid of the key issue of fuel poverty, because if we really achieved it, if we made every single home really energy efficient, kept the heat in, we won't have to pay fossil fuel bills. And that's the best way of protecting people from fuel poverty. It will take 20 years, but we're all agreed on this. We are all agreed that the transition that all the political parties, and that's come back to what I said at the very start about when you get this consensus, Ireland can be good at making changes. So we have consensus on this. There are technical variations in terms of whether it's carbon tax or not, but that's not the big picture. We do need a carbon tax. But, but the consensus is that we will do this, and, it's a, and we have to make it a just transition. Social justice has to come with ecological justice at the same time. And it's the only debate in the political sphere is, is how you actually do it. So some of the other parties have issued manifestos that don't set that out. It's not an easy thing to do. But I don't think whoever forms the next government can ignore it. Because the other risk is if we did ignore it and we keep going the way we're going, we would end up paying the European Union something like 7 billion euro fines from the commitments we're entered into, and we will not be allowed off the hook on this. So I prefer to spend the 7 billion now, starting in our homes, improving people's health and security at the same time. And, and critically, housing and transport go together, so that it's not just you have a warm home, but that you have a way of getting around which is safe and affordable for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Eamon, I'm going to put a question to you that I put to uh, three of the other five speakers. Um, I'm putting it to you now. Our neighbours and our friends and our relatives uh, on the other island off the west coast of Europe have gone through a traumatic five or six year period of which Brexit and the, the vote was simply the, the latest manifestation of it. I think they are emotionally battered and bruised, but they're still our neighbours. Um, how would you, if you're a member of the government, how would you propose to reconstruct a relationship between Britain and Ireland, North and South, 
uh, to get them back into the space where we actually uh, can work together because we have so much in common together. Can I give an example of what we've done the last year or two? Because as, as I've, it immediately comes to my mind, we wrote in the Joint Office Communications Committee to the House of Commons Committee that was looking at the issue of disinformation and fake news by, back at the, on, and as a result of what happened in Brexit, the, the influence of social media on that campaign, Cambridge Analytica. And we went to the House of Commons and we sat down with them in terms of working, trying to agree what is the approach that democracies take to that. And it is in that every day, you know yourself, Rory, yeah. it's the lived experience of just meeting people, yeah. getting on. And we did that quite deliberately, in my mind, or my interest in it, was to maintain relations. And not just in the obvious negotiation centres, but in those sort of ways. Right. Um, with regard to them, and so we need to do that at scale everywhere, on energy and on, on all, on all these issues. It can't be left to Mr. Barnier to negotiate the 10 areas that have to be agreed as well as uh, with including the free trade agreement. I, I think we should be proactively involved with our good relations with the House of Commons to and our Scottish and Welsh colleagues, the British Irish Council and beyond, to really maintain human relations. Up north, and this is obviously a very central stage in our own debate here at the moment, my colleague Claire Bailey, head of the Green Party in Northern Ireland, has said we should be careful around avoiding the mistakes they made in the UK. If we rush a referendum the way they rush Brexit, where you don't really know what's the right question to ask, and you don't certainly know the outcome, depending on what the answer of that question is, we'll just make the same mistake that they made. So I agree with her, and I think our role, particularly as an all-island party, and we have very good relationship with our, uh, within the European Green Party of our UK colleagues, but particularly up north, I think ourselves and other parties have a real responsibility as being gen completely cross-community and not identity politics in that unionist versus nationalist way and I think um, I mean we we'll, you know work with Sinn Féin and, and, and it's not a you know we, we have a history of working with all parties so I'm, I'm, I'm not being critical of them and that but I think Claire is right she's kind of she, she, she confuses everything because she grew up in the Falls Road went to then a mixed community up in North Antrim went off to Holland for a while people don't know what to make of her the fact that she had to go into the assembly and declare what she was I think she put in ecologist or feminist rather than the kind of identity politics on the other side. I think we have a particular responsibility, working with all parties up north, to actually approach this issue that's coming inevitably out of the Brexit process in a way that avoids the mistakes they made in the UK. Thank you. There's a question over here. Thank you. Um, Michele Krepatz, Trinity College Dublin Political Science. Um, I have a question. I mean, it's very practical, and it doesn't necessarily concern Brexit, but I think it's kind of important to underline this. So um, your green agenda um, requires a large state intervention and an investment in infrastructure. And we know from past experiences in Europe, but also in Ireland, that this often creates opportunities for conflict of interest and corruption. Um, and I would like to know if you think that Ireland and other European countries are well equipped to guarantee that these resources are used in a transparent and efficient way. Uh, and uh, if not, what specific uh, policies would be needed in order to ensure like, integrity in such a radical change? Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> I can speak to, I cannot speak to other countries' experience because I don't have knowledge. I do have knowledge here. We have a history of corruption in our planning system that did huge damage to our country. It's le leaving huge long-term costs in the form of long-distance commutes and lack of services connected to housing and so on. So it's not, we're not without that risk. Um, I think the, one of the best ways of, of, I'm particularly interested in the whole issue of digital policy work we did here in the Institute on it, bringing in international speakers was, was hugely informative for me. Um, one of the best ways of avoiding that corruption coming back is through completely open, open government data systems where there's absolute transparency on every single contract, where if there's a bollard up the road where someone's digging a hole for a demanded pipe, that you could look straight online and say, that's Paddy Murphy construction crew, there's, here's the contract arrangements, here's the, that level. Now you have to be careful around privacy and, uh, but I think the basic concept, Brendan Hahn was working this on the last time in his, office, I don't remember heard of him speaking it, but open government transparency around data is one of the best ways of securing against 
that sort of corruption and, and from the smallest job right to the biggest. Um, we're not immune, we shouldn't be complacent, but I'll be honest, in my experience, I haven't in my lifetime, I don't know people, in my business career or in my political career, I've never had to approach someone approach me and ask for something that's untoward. Maybe I misread something, maybe someone was <laughs> winking. Um, I, that's why I stand by our democracy. That's why I think we've strength. We have an independent legal system. We have to admit, protect and retain an independent media system. And we have a constitutional democratic system that oversees that, that protects people's rights. But we should not be complacent. We should ensure transparency as our guard dog against us falling back to ways that we did see in my living in memory. Thank you. There's a question over here. Yes, please. If you can stand up so that we can see you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tom Ferris, Life Member of the Institute. It's really to add on to the question that was asked. In mid-December, and I think it got lost in the Christmas period, the new public spending code was published, which has new requirements, robust requirements, and in particular on capital projects, the need to publish at different stages, not at the final stage, preliminary business, business stage, etc., so that while it takes two to tango, there is a mechanism there if it's used by government departments. Can I, can I, and I, I've been supportive and defending of the public service, which I am, but I do want to present another review in a way that, um, in terms of spending in the public code and public procurement. We've known about climate change for 30, 40 years. We've known the need to price carbon for the similar length of time. I must admit, I've been just slightly distraught in recent years when I realised in asking Pascal Donnelly about this that our price of carbon we were applying to public infrastructure project was up until the recent months was something like eight euros a tonne which was reckless and I also in this Climate Rockless Commission that we've set up I must be honest it was truly shocking when we asked the Secretary General from the Department of Public for Climate Change Communications Climate Action and Environment what assessment was made in the recent National Development Plan of climate effect of the plan? And the answer was none. None. There was no assessment of climate in a National Development Plan that was only agreed a year and a half ago. And I asked the Secretary General of the Department of Transport, what is the projected transport emissions for 2030? We don't, we don't know was the answer. So part of our job, there's an extra tension between the political system and the public service system. It's not a bad tension. It is like Yesminster. You get used to that and deal with it. And it's not out of disrespect. But part of my job and our job is to hold the public sector account. And I believe in terms of how we've assessed our public expenditure particularly, we've completely failed. The National Development Plan as written is not fit for purpose. It has to go. That's the scale of change that we would go into any negotiation seeking to make. And that's not an easy thing to say. I don't mean to be critical of individuals, but that's the truth as I see it. And I don't think we're serving our people if we stick to that way. Thank you very much. I think uh, on behalf of the audience that I can express their appreciation and my own appreciation for the, the breadth and the um, knowledge that you've displayed and the humility with which you've explored it. Uh, I'd like the audience present to show their appreciation in the normal way.